Welcome to the Mad Ones. I'm your really I'm too tired from this dang work day to write myself a funny intro host, Cam Harless. And with me, as always, is your favorite female hostess, Miss Jessica Green. How are you doing, Jessica? <laughs> what? <laughs> Let's just glaze over that part. That's that's the next episode, to be honest. <laughs> you, you are a girl and they like you just because of that. That's it. I Nothing else. Girl. No other have been your whole life. <laughs> uh, fun. <laughs> so we have a, we have another another Valentine's episode for you today. This one on the less meandering, but fun. And um, I'm not saying it's not going to be fun, but you know, goofy side. Goofy is the right word. More right. academic, even uh, for you today. But before we do that, let me just tell you: this show is a hundred percent brought to you by the fans and patrons. So. Right. Hit like, subscribe on YouTube so that, you know, build that stuff up and join our Patreon because right now this is an early episode. If you are a patron, you could be watching this live right now, but you're not. So, you know, get on that. Get on uh, that. We also do uh, Zoom hangouts occasionally, mm -hmm. and you'll make me eternally grateful if you go to patreon.com slash the mad ones and sign up. Also, if you want a shirt, I, I design those. And I put them on wearethemadones.com slash store. We have shirts, tanks, and um, mugs at this point. But that's it. If you want something else, tell me. I, I mean, the, the amount of stuff that I can put this logo on is ridiculous. <laughs> Nudie pens, I, playing cards, whatever you want. you want that? Do you want that? I don't want that. <laughs> They're only right. of Cam, though. <laughs> it's just me. Just me. You don't want them. The the, the I feel bad for the artist. No, you turn uh, the pen upside down and his beard goes away. No, no, no. It just grows. <laughs> Even better. I like this. <laughs> I like this merch we're inventing on the fly. <laughs> but let's get to the to the meat and potatoes. Tonight we're joined by a man that is currently in the jungle, a preacher, a teacher, and a lover of church history. He's a man who uh, loves telling the stories of the saints and bringing the sermons, the sermons of old. Uh, he took time out of his busy schedule. He's currently in the middle of a work day, but he said, you know what? To heck with it. I want to talk to Cam and Jessica. Uh, he's the man who, he's going to talk to us about the man who inspired Valentine's Day, St. Valentine. So joining us right now is Troy Frazier of Revive Studios. How you doing, bud? Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, we have done this not that long ago with St. Nicholas, so it's like, oh, hey, we're back. It's another holiday, right? Right, and I decided to spare you St. Patrick. I, well, Maybe hey, next year. St. Patrick, you know, my wife would be the one that to do that anyway, because she did him on uh, her podcast, Martyrs and Missionaries, um, that she okay. runs. And I, so I just had to pass it on her, but I let her take care of that, which her show, <laughs> she has a catchy name, Martyrs and Missionaries, and it just mm -hmm. does um, better than our show does. And I mean, just <laughs> with one episode, she hits the same number of downloads as us with like a half. The, I'm like, what is this? Way less work for you. But she also is a female host. And I, I, we, we also go through that same problem of just they have beautiful voices. That's what people want to listen to. That's true. The only thing that I can think of is a lot of women have these wonderful voices to listen to. But then there's the occasional female who's speaking and like the her register is like up here. And it's like, OK, could you just maybe man it up just a little bit so that i can listen to you talk please. oh no see i'm the opposite i will take a nice squeaky whatever kind of voice you want to have i just cannot i don't like girls when they're like they're not natural voices here but clearly for some reason behind the radio they start talking like this and i'm just like i don't that sounds so weird to me why are you delivering the news to me like you've got like a frog in your throat i don't get it or how everyone on npr has kind of like this yeah, asmr whisper that they're doing yeah, and I'm like, they all do that talk? <laughs> no, yeah, that's exactly it. Like the uh, there was a news station in Kansas City where I, we were living before, and this one girl always like she would like she would do like banter with the host, and it would sound totally normal. And then she would start reading the news, and it would just always go like way too deep. I'm like, why are you like trying to compete with the baritone like news host right. guy? Just be yourself, girl. <laughs> Early on in this show, before we rebranded it, we the first several episodes were like pr we scripted them. And so, you know, was, we, we wanted to make sure it hit all the points of, but um, what, when you do that, it's really hard not to go into NPR voice naturally mm. because you're reading something and you don't want it to, you don't, you're like in your head and you're like, welcome to the mad ones. My name is Cam Harless. 
this week we're talking oh. about organ transplants. That's oh, enough. No. That's enough of that. <laughs> but anything slightly a ASMR makes my uh, like <laughs> makes my skin crawl. I know it gives some people comfort, but for me, for some reason, it just makes my spine want to run away from my back. Like I just hate it. Sorry. Welcome to the mad ones ahead. ASMR. I was no. gonna say, no. well, we definitely we won't we won't do that for you. Then no worries. Today we're talking Thank about St. Valentine's Day. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm in hell. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, in December, I think technically November, we talked about St. Uh, Nicholas and yeah. his real story and how he became Santa Claus. This is another, uh, well, obviously Christmas is named after Jesus rather than you there know, you go. a saint. But it's there with Saint with Santa, it's like very based for a lot of people in, on this character that was derived from a saint. But mm -hmm. with St. Valentine, there's like one sentence worth of a story that people know yes. about the naming of this of this holiday and it's it's very i haven't done any research i decided to come in you know virgin ears to, to learn and okay. i know jessica did some stuff for for her church so she has some knowledge so she's she's gonna bear the brunt of intelligent questions i'm gonna do the dumb <laughs> dumb ones from Ooh. just hearing it the first time um, well i will see how intelligent i will i mean because like you said saint valentine himself a, a he's not even one person but b he there is very little so i end up just doing more of like research on how we got from here to there on valentine's yeah. day because there's so little to the actual story of saint valentine but it is really interesting like how we got from even just how we got from like this feast of a martyr to this love holiday that you have to do it, it just is kind of to me it was kind of fascinating because yeah it, yeah it evolved a ton just like with christmas the story just kept evolving and evolving and what you started with and what you ended with are so different mm -hmm. so to give the sentence worth that most people know which may be the whole story uh from the only thing i ever heard except for in shows that made jokes was that um saint valentine was a roman priest and when uh, at one point due to lack of soldiers in war he had this uh the emperor of rome i want to say his name was what was his name claudius claudius, claudius, claudius gothica or something mm -hmm. like that gothicus mm -hmm. or something i don't know why i remembered goth i something about that stuck out to me um but he had banned marriage and so saint valentine was doing was secretly doing marriages behind his back black market christian marriages and saint valentine got beheaded for it that's what i've got so that's one of the stories of saint valentine so in the same era like from the year like 250 to 300 there are three saint valentines you you mentioned one of their stories um there's another one who was a christian and his companions all died in africa and literally like if you look up like four different websites that's just all that says it says saint Val like valentine and his companions died in africa and you're like well what did how did they die what did they do any we have no information beyond that just that they died in africa <laughs> and then there's a third one who was like the bishop of either rome or a place called Terni, and he from the scenes of things was traveling was doing uh, God's word, preaching and teaching, but he gets thrown in prison and then he gets beheaded because he won't stop preaching the name of Christ. So there are thought to be three different St. Valentines, but it's even more confusing because some scholars are kind of going back now and going like, well, how do we know the marriage Valentine and this other Valentine aren't just the same guy? Other than the fact that the years that they died seem to be different. But then again, that could have just been the story getting mistold and misremembered. And so, you know, the same guy who is marrying people might have also been preaching Christ and not stopping. There are there is a little bit more to his story, but to have fun with the story of Valentine's Day, there's so if you Google like origins of ha Valentine's Day, if you were to you could do that right now, you would come up with like five different websites that would all say the same thing about this really weird pagan holiday that comes before it. So I want to tell you about this really weird pagan holiday. But then I'm going to kind of pull the rag out from under us and explain how it actually is not related to Valentine's Day at all. But okay. if you were looking it up, you would see this weird this weird pagan holiday that comes before it that gets right. associated with Valentine's Day. But re but realistically, from the research I was doing, it's not actually a very fair association. But let's just kind of walk through it because it's such a okay. weird holiday. We can't skip over it. <laughs> 
So this holiday happens either in the, what would have happened in ancient Rome. It was called, and I'm going to mess up this name because I'm not an ancient Roman, but Lupercalia. And it would have either happened on February 13th, February 14th, or February 15th in history. And again, if you look up like scholarly sources, 98% of them are going to tell you like this holiday is just not, the, the connection is really weak. But if you look up any pop sources, like your average person Googling around having fun, this is what's going to come up. And this holiday looper, you know, has to do with like lupus, has to do with like wolves. And that's okay. because this is a holiday to honor the wolf that Romulus and Remus got their milk from, because okay. of course it would be. And so the priests were called, again, Luperci, and that's, you know, again, I'm not Italian. So Luperci, um, where, they, where the priests would name themselves, and they would, it was this violent, and according to, again, the research, you'll see this, like, very fertility, love, yep. sexy feast in the 500. It goes all the way back to the 500s. We know that for sure. So the 500s BC. So it's mm -hmm. old. And they would sacrifice either a wolf or a goat, for fertility and virility, um, you know, so that the next year's harvest and that, you know, ladies would have what they need. And so they sacrifice this goat, like in a cave, they do the dancing <clears throat> and whatever they're going to do. And one of them will be chosen to have like the blood wiped all over them. And then sometimes they would take milk and wipe the blood off, I guess, to represent the milk of Romulus and Remus. And I don't know if they left that on or not. And then this <laughs> priest would take slabs of whatever they just sacrificed, slabs of the blood, and he would take off all his clothes or most of his clothes and run into the village, and people would be lined up, ladies would be specifically, and he would hit them with yep. this slab of goat or wolf blood meat and would yeah. hit them on their arms, hit them wherever, and that was a good thing. Like, noble ladies <laughs> wanted to get hit by the guy yep. uh, before all the blood was gone because that meant that their pregnancies would either be easier or if they weren't already pregnant, that they would become pregnant. Like they, they would no longer be barren if they got hit. Yep. And can, can I just make this connection to, to how Old you Testament law? Your Valentine's Day? Because yeah, it's pretty <laughs> much the same way, right? Yeah, exactly. No, I was just going to say, like we're reading through Acts in our Bible study right now. And there was the, the I, I want to say it was Acts 15. <clears throat> They're sending the instructions to the Gentiles in the church. I want to say in Antioch about what, you know, they were expected to do when it came to following Mosaic law. And it was like, don't drink blood. And so it really like that kind of ritual, yeah. regardless of whether or not it's connected to Valentine's day is it kind of goes to show why God was like, Hey guys, don't do the blood stuff. You're too, you know, Greece and Rome, all of this, mm. they do weird weird rituals with blood they drink it they put it on their faces don't yeah. do that right <laughs> so that connection is very interesting to me just wanted to pull that yeah out. There, there's this story of david livingston is totally not related to valentine's day but there's a story of david livingston when he first he's the missionary went to africa first european to cross the continent he did all this exploration and told all these people about Dr. jesus livingston, i presume yes exactly and um what he when he says when he first got there he like went to the like where the missionaries were and he was so mad. He's like, these people are living like heathens. What are you missionaries even doing? Are you guys even trying to teach them about God? Like these people are totally godless and amoral and you guys are doing a terrible job. But then he moved out like way out into the tribes. And then he spent some time with the people who had never heard about Jesus. And when he came back, he said, okay, yeah, now I know. Okay, I understand now. These people that you're working with have come a long way when I compare them <laughs> to the people who've never heard about <laughs> Jesus Christ at all. You guys have actually done pretty good work. And I think that, like, it's so easy for us to assume, especially when we read about Rome and Greece and we hear about the philosophy and stuff, that we forget this is the kind of weird stuff these people were doing on a pretty regular basis. And we, we are so removed from that because of how much Christianity pulled the pagan stuff away. But that, that was us. That would have been all of us had Christianity yep. not come in and canceled it all. Like we would all be like Dr. Livingston said, I didn't realize how bad we were until I went out and got away from where Christians had been. And then I realized we do some weird stuff as human beings. And I think <laughs> yeah. that, that this is just one of those examples of the stuff we were doing when we had no Jesus to tell us not to. Which right. is wild because it's, it's because, you know, one of, there was a lot of really weird and strange stuff that happened in like the Nordic countries when it came to their, their pantheon yeah. and mythology. Um, but it's just, it's weird to me. I, we, I don't remember if it was on the show 
or if it was on in the Bible study. But this kind of thing, I've seen a, a huge uptick in Norse heathens. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I of those gods just wild. Yeah, I met a guy when I was in China. He was from Estonia. Very nice guy. Um, it, we, we got along great. But one of the first conversations we had is he was like, yeah, I'm a pagan. Like, I worship trees. I was like, what? That was a little, <laughs> I, well, at but least you know what you do, I guess. Worshiping trees is all well and good. But when you have to, like, code up, cut open a goat, we're going <laughs> to see how real, really pagan you yeah. are. At that <laughs> then point, this yeah. is really getting fun, I guess. Um, right. And so, the, so that was the story. And like, it's fun to like say, like, what a crazy story. This holiday, I mean, if it started, if it was, if it started in the 500s BC, which it might have started before that, it went on till nearly 580. So for a thousand years, ancestors of many of us was like, this is a normal middle of February event. Like, I'm gonna go do this. This is just what we do. Even a hundred years after the Roman Empire, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But even a hundred years after the Roman Empire had outlawed all the non-Christian holidays, this holiday was going strong. So again, like it seems super weird to us in retrospect, but this was a very big deal during the Roman time. They did not mm -hmm. want to give it up. Now this rumor gets attached to it where this idea that men, if you get, if you Google it, you'll see this, men would pick a date and they would reach their hand into a jar and pull out names of like single ladies and they would have to go with them to the great, you know, whipping of blood ceremony. And that this was a part of how you kind of hooked up. And then it was because everyone's, you know, all all randy after a bloody good time, that this is something <laughs> that would lead to um, them getting together and whatnot. And this right. was kind of like a way to get a marriage date going on. And this is the story you will see on a lot of websites. Here's the couple problems. A, that story about the name and the urn thing, we can actually trace it back to a guy named, I think his name is Alan Butler. I didn't put it in my notes. In the 1700s. <laughs> and he definitely just made that up. Like there's no, there's nowhere before Alan. that that ever comes. He actually, there was a thing where men used to pick up the names of like single ladies in the 13 and 1400s, but that was like a way to find a wife. Like, oh, we have a few single guys, we have a few single ladies. Let's just have them draw names and they can get married kind of thing. Which the priest put an end to by the 1600s. More than likely, this guy heard that story and just kind of wanted to associate it because he wanted to associate Valentine's Day as just a Catholic church stealing this holiday. So he added this love story in the middle of it to make it seem more like this is love, 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 right? And right. when you take that out of it, there's really no romance in the original version of the story. It's just a classic fertility, virility, you know, health and wealth, prosperity kind of thing. Because they would also take the meat and they would hit farm fields with it to say like, hey, this farm field needs to have more growth this year. So that's not exactly a romantic idea. This is really just your classic, we're asking the gods to bless this kind of thing. And so now the original, this a pagan holiday, when you take away the love story and you take away you know, that, it really doesn't have anything to do with love. And on the flip side, neither does Valentine's original holiday. The original Valentine story, like the feast whom they're celebrating, it's with the exception of maybe the part where the one Valentine, one of the possible Valentines is marrying people. There's not really a whole lot in his story either to do with love. And so even though this, like this gets, these two things get locked together, they're not very much locked together. Also the Pope who kind of brought in Valentine's Day, brought in at the end of the 500s, or sorry, the end of the 400s, like that kind of right, 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 almost at the beginning of the sixth century, um, he was against the other holiday, but that other holiday was really only celebrated in Rome, like the city, not the Roman Empire, but in the city of Rome okay. area. But the Valentine's feast was for everyone. And so if you're replacing a holiday with this feast, of, you know, a martyr, like you don't need to replace that for everyone if it's just your town that's kind of celebrating this yeah. really weird thing. And so, again, the number of ways that this connection is just kind of skipped over and like it, 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 they just don't really, it doesn't fit. It's not fitting. It's not really that, it's not really that tight, I think. Now there is a little bit more to Valentine's story, not because I think that's real, but like, just like how St. Nicholas over time, his story got embellished and he went from like, I'm St. Nicholas and I give, you know, presents to the poor to like his blood oozes healing powers and all these, you know, crazy kind of things. Um, one of the Valentines, like their story also started to kind of be getting, more and more exaggerated as time got on and so eventually whoever whichever one you want to kind of choose here that you think is the real one mm -hmm. um he ends up going to prison after he ends up spending like he'll spend a he'll he'll not only be marrying christians um together secretly but he starts breaking christians who get married out of jail he becomes this like heroic guy he's breaking christians out of jail all the time and then eventually he gets thrown in jail 
And one account had him like healing a blind person while in jail. I don't know mm -hmm. if that one was very legit. But then eventually he um, falls in love with the jailer's daughter and they can't be together. And so he's, you know, you know, because he's going to die. So he's heartbroken, but he writes her one last very long love letter and signs it, yours, Valentine. And they're like, and that's where the idea of a Valentine Day card came from. Um, it's a cute story. It's great. It definitely was invented way after the fact. So that like definitely didn't happen um, in 200, you know, AD. That was definitely something someone probably in the 1600s or 1700s added on to beef up the story of Valentine. But that is some of the official, you know, legend associated with him again much like saint nicholas they added and kept adding pieces to it to make the story um more exciting but where is his skull his skull <laughs> gosh yeah actually there Which was one? somebody who had it i yeah i don't remember where i do remember reading it when i was doing it but i don't remember where they put it and it wasn't stolen multiple times like saint nicholas's body was so that made it less exciting Oh, um, bummer. <laughs> yeah. There are like seven different cities that claim to have um, the skull of St. Valentine. But when you look at how many St. Valentines there actually were, it's kind of like, okay, maybe you do because he's like eight different guys. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who knows? You know, it, yeah. could, it could be. It could be. Um, the whole thing is a little weird. And like the one part of the story that I don't like to, like, the because I like a nice succession of events where I can, like, okay, like St. Nicholas had that where it's like, okay, this happened in the 400s, this happened in the 700s, this happened in 900s, and you can see it growing. You know, you can kind of see where we go from St. Nicholas, the person, and then his bones scattering, like, you know, a couple hundred years later. Right. But with St. Valentine, you just, like, it ends in, like, 500, and the next time anybody talks about it again is, like, the year 1300, and you have to skip over, like, 800 years of history. I yeah. don't know what was going on during those 800 years of history and how... Um, what was happening in the Middle Ages with St. Valentine and the ideas behind them. So, like, we lose all of that time frame. And the next time we really see St. Valentine mentioned, or, like, Valentine's Day mentioned, is in the 1300s. And by that point, it's kind of already beginning to be this love holiday. And I kind of, I, I find that only frustrating, maybe just for me. I just like to see how things grow. And it's really hard yeah. to do that when you skip 800 years. <laughs> um, but Geoffrey Chaucer, the famous writer who um, I believe wrote, was it the Canterbury Tales, also yep. wrote a book called Parliament of Fowls, Fowls, which I have never read. And I didn't even look up what it was about because anything less than a bunch of birds in Parliament yelling at each other would be um, a letdown. <laughs> and so I just want to... Oh, exactly. you're going to be so let down. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to keep it in my mind as that's yeah. what it is. And I if think If you want to read something, I, you could read the, what's it called? The Court of Owls, the Batman comic books. Yeah, that there are no owls in court, but there are people wearing owl masks, and that's a little bit better. Yeah, see, and that and that's in my mind, the Parliament of Fowls is just straight up birds fighting with each other. Like this is you know the, <laughs> the crow you version should, of Winston Churchill pecking keep, at a uh, at a like a, a, a mockingbird or something. Just go ahead and keep that version in your heart, because the real <laughs> version will probably disappoint you Have compared you to read? a story like that. Yeah, no, I've um, Ch Chaucer is somebody that I've. Um, looked into extensively, actually, because a lot of our cultural t traditions today are actually informed by things that Chaucer started in the, what, 1400s when he was writing. So mm -hmm. um, we don't realize it, but like the practice of giving a card to your sweetheart actually began with Chaucer, not with St. Valentine. And in the part, which I'm sure you're about to get into with the Parliament yeah. of Fowls, um, he, he mentions um, this is the time of year where birds find their sweethearts. Yeah. Basically. So he, he basically kind of puts, okay. So the middle ages had this idea that birds found their like true love bird. Cause like, you know, they found their mate on February 14th. Now this was already a thing um, that was <laughs> happening. Like they already had this legend at this point had been around for a while. Don't know why they chose February 14th, but they, you know, and I look at it as kind of like groundhogs say, right? Like, why do we think a groundhog on this one day of the year <laughs> can predict winter? I don't think any of us really do, but it's just fun. We just kind of celebrate, ah, whatever the groundhog, right? I kind of think that this, this bird thing is the same way. Like they know that that's not actually the day, probably the birds fall in love forever, but like, it's a fun <laughs> tradition. You can talk about love birds or something silly like that, whatever, right? And so he kind of adds into the story, um, the Parliament of Fowls, if you haven't read it, it's about these birds in court and they're passing a law. And it's a really big story, mostly about birds. At least that's how I, I recall it. And um, 
he says like this goddess puts the birds together on February 14th on the feast of St. Valentine. And so like, he's, he's putting this, like this idea now that Valentine is more than just a martyr's death day because of this, this, you know, silly idea of birds getting together in love or whatnot. This is becoming a day associated with love. And again, I wish I could go through all the details of every single exactness of how we get from point A to point B on that. But when you skip over 800 years of history, you don't really get to get that as well. So for right. but people are starting to put this together. And Chaucer is one of those very early people associating those things together that we see. In the 1300s and in the 1400s, we see people are writing love and writing poetry. And we see this is kind of becoming a day to confess feelings for, which I didn't understand at first. I was like, why is that? But then when I was doing later research here, I realized, oh, that's because like back in the day when you wrote a letter, you couldn't just like put it in the mail and it just, you had to like go hand them your love letter. So if you were giving right. them a love letter, if you were giving them poetry, um, that was a very much a confession of feelings to somebody because you had to probably hand deliver it, right? Mm -hmm. um, this also was making Valentine very popular in England and France because they are they're a little bit more big on romantic love than say like Poland and Ukraine and this was kind of more <laughs> of, of a thing for them which is kind of cool because like you know we we look at the 1300s and 1400s as um not the most pleasant time to live you know nobody's taking a time machine back hoping to get real estate in like 1350 England or sorry France because <laughs> you got the hundred years war you've got the black plague you've got the mini ice age that happened like 30 years 30 years before that like it's a terrible time to be alive but this is also when we see like love flourishing and this idea mm -hmm. of romantic love and poetry kind of kicking off and get some steam and we also see I mean then that was happening in the middle ages already but we just are starting to find those things are surviving from that era better and we also see, again, this idea of Valentine's Day is coming to be. By the year 1400, um, King Charles in France, which if you know about the Hundred Years' War, he's like not the most powerful person. Things aren't going great in France. And that little era um, from 1400 to 1420, he just near, like they just nearly lose France completely. But he puts together what is called the Charter of the Court of Love. And they invite all these young men and uh, to perform some songs. And like these young women will kind of judge it. It's a fun time, a performance song, kind of young for the youth. It's in the middle of Paris and it happens on February 14th. Again, getting this association of love, yep. young love into the minds of the people. And maybe it was just a fun, nice time. It could have been a coincidence. There was also like a super bad plague in town. So it could have been just like, hey, let's stop talking about the plague. We have the fun charter court of love. But I only yeah. saw one source say that there was a plague in town, but it was like Oxford. So it's probably probably not made up. Um, we don't in, know, but you got that kind of time, association growing. The plague at that point was coming through every 20 years and it yeah. came through on a cycle. So it's like if on and off times for the plague, pretty much for that whole like 500 year period. Yeah, for sure. And it's kind of like it's kind of like today when we look at hurricane season. So it's going to be a bad hurricane year. Um, El Nino is in effect. And back then it was like, oh, yeah, it's going to be. Um, you know, play year. You know, it's gonna get used to get used yep. to say goodbye to some loved ones, just kind of yep. a given. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of when we see. So again, we're seeing these things, these these associations are building on this day. And in the year 1415, we find what is known as the oldest known Valentine. It was written by Charles, the Duke of Orleans, who was writing a love letter. He called like it's called he called it a Valentine from the from the Tower of London. And he wrote it to his wife and had it delivered. Um, so now we're officially, we have this love notes have been getting passed and back and forth, but now there officially is one that's like, okay, this is called a Valentine and Aww. it's getting associated with Valentine's day. And then later on we have King Henry V um, who's creating, who like hires a famous poet to help him write his love Valentine to Catherine. So we're getting these associations are really starting to build and it's getting like closer and closer together. Ophelia and Shakespeare she mentions Valentine's and her famous thing where she's like, and look, I don't know a lot of Shakespeare. Honestly, this might make me not seem very nice, but I thought Shakespeare is a little overhyped. I'm going to be honest with you. I read a lot of Shakespeare <laughs> in high school because all the people like Shakespeare is so deep. He's just, oh my goodness. He's so good. And I like 95% like kind of, of the people who said that couldn't understand what the heck he was talking about though. I was looking at, I was like, I'm sure he's fine. He's good. I guess. I mean, well, like, it's I don't like, know. I, yeah. It's like Chaucer. Chaucer, at the same time, he was the only game in town. 
He was yeah. the guy writing all of the books. Shakespeare was the guy writing all of the books. Not that many people put out content at that time. Yeah. So you had like one main guy doing it and that was Schatzer, that was Shakespeare. Now we've got everybody and their mother makes content, but yeah. wasn't always so. See, Here and I thought when you said that something about the first Valentine, it was going to be from the Duke of Hallmark. <laughs> talk about so I actually talk about that at the end because I know some friends of mine, even yesterday, who were like, oh, this is a Hallmark holiday. And I'm like, um, I got history for you because not kind of, <laughs> not kind of, but not really. But like, no, I, for me, and if this turns people off, that's fine. I don't care. Um, but like Shakespeare, it drove me crazy. Like when people were like, he's so deep in high school and stuff, I didn't like reading like literature because I thought it was just all more Shakespeare. And I was like, he just seems like he likes to hear, you know, I was like, oh, it can't be good. And then when I finally picked up like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and some actually like really good books, I was like, wait, you were hiding this from me to make me read Romeo and Juliet all this time. I was so annoyed. And I was like, you, there were so many better books I could have been reading. And you were making me read so much of the Sagam Shakespeare instead. I am in love, like as a human woman in love with a man, I am in love with Dostoevsky. I, yeah, he's everyone so should read him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, he, he is absolutely the king and his and he does it all all of it with dialogue. He doesn't hardly describe anything. Yes. He does less. He's like, there's a chair in the room. It's, anyway, we're going to talk the great things of life now. <laughs> Moving he on. doesn't have to describe the Russian village because we have all yeah. seen a village before. We know what thatched roofs looks like. His characters yep. are the set. And so I you think that's amazing. He's the opposite of J.R.R. Tolkien. In every respect, because <laughs> Tolkien spends like more of your time than you have left to live on Earth describing the scenery. Oh. And whereas Dostoevsky uses his characters to set the scene. And I really no appreciate that. Rings, though. Mm -hmm. I I have um I've only enjoyed J.R. Tolkien's cinematic works, to put it um, <laughs> He's I, a great director. Favorite. Yeah. So, yeah, his, so his cinema is really good, but I can't talk to his <laughs> No, the the cinematographers had so much to work with because he detailed every little leaf and grass and tree in the set. And it's like great i can really imagine this world very detailed but i don't want to be here anymore <laughs> yeah that's you and i have a very similar approach i would much rather hear a conversation than than read yes. the, the the very long detailed or detailed uh, metaphors day, of like a mountain pass one day i'd love to talk with you just for half an hour about the brothers karamazov if you've read that so okay, that one I haven't read. I have read the idiot. I've read notes from the underground house. I've read the love letters one or like whatever that one is. I read poor folk. I think poor folk is the love letters one. So I've read like three or four of them. But I every time I start the brothers Karamazov, I always get so busy in life I can't finish it. It's the magnum frustrated. opus. The book is like this thick. So I yeah I understand. But do yourself a favor and like set aside some time and get through it. And then yeah. call me because we're gonna have a big long conversation. Right. I'm still okay. <laughs> recovering from War and Peace, so I I, you know, I read that one like oh. four or five years ago, and it took yeah. so much out of me that I feel like I'm like I'm not yet ready for. Oh, I'm not quite <laughs> sure, but yeah. Like shake with a <laughs> cup of coffee. Like. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so that's Ophelia. So he, she's talking about Valentine's Day. It's it's super a love story at this point. And then by the 1600s, people are giving each other gifts, notes, letters, candy is now getting in there too. Chocolate's getting its day. And I took a little sidestep here to talk about a very important person because like in Saint Nicholas, you know, Santa, he's the mythological yeah. creature associated. But there is a mythological creature associated with Valentine's Day as well, and that is Cupid. I was about and to ask like, where the fat winged baby yeah. with so i had arrows. this i was literally writing my notes and when i got to this point i was like so how do we get to cupid from here and cupid if you know your greek mythology which i mean of course we all do and nobody had to google this beforehand because they knew like no, nothing there's not besides. a google there's not a thing up right here with yeah a description at all i definitely had to um you know like uh, my my greek mythology maybe sort of begins and ends with clash of the titans um and that's about as far <laughs> as i know classic so uh yeah, so I had to look it up. Cupid was originally the Greek god Eros, and like the 700s to like the 400s BC, Eros was like this invincible, all powerful Greek god. He could do anything. He could like change your wills and like bend your heart to his will. He's like the the actually like the most powerful of the Greek pantheon of gods um, during this time. And then like the scholars are like, but as the rights of women went down and nobility went up and whatever. whatever, whatever the, the Greek god of Eros change. I, okay, I don't know about all that. I, I'm not sure how much of this had to do with class warfare and how much of this was just they changed the story. But at some point, 
they decide, you know what, Eros is like too powerful of a god. <laughs> like he interrupts the story too much. So we're gonna change Wasn't him. Wasn't he like a to, god of mischief? He, I'm not sure how much he, he was, but he was also just like he could win every story. Like as soon as he got involved, it was over because he's Eros. Like he could because he can change your will. Like he can control your heart and like he could do a bunch of other things too. He could never die. He was just way overpowered. Like he was like when little kids make superhero movies or something and they're like, like my daughter will be like, you have firepower. I have ice power. And I also have water power and I also have fire power. And then I can fly. And you're like, wait a second, you gave yourself too many powers. This doesn't it's like work. The, and that's the do the do sex machina is that yeah. if you don't know how to finish a story. You just drop an all powerful God, God in. Yes. Yeah. Like, he's, and he, then the God just finishes the story. Yes, he's like the blue guy from the Watchmen, whatever that I only remember watching Doctor Manhattan like once, but he was like way overpowered and like took away from the story, and that's how I feel like um Eros was. So they turned him into Aphrodite's son, and they're like, Okay, now Aphrodite, his mom, kind of helps control his power. And then they were like, And while he's a son, let's just kind of make him a baby. <laughs> so now he's like <laughs> he's a baby now because he's the son of this woman, and he has power, but he's a baby. And then I guess they just give him, well, like, you can't have him be a baby without anything. So they give him some bow and arrows, and he controlled, like, love. And you're, again, it's more of desire. Like, he controls your will, what you desire for. Which, again, is still pretty overpowered. But around that time, the Romans invade, and they kind of start changing things up. And they're like, hey, we like Eros. We like him as this baby. We're going to give him wings, and we're going to – and he might have already had wings at that point. And, like, and we're going to make him, like, the love god. And so he's Cupid now. And to be honest, like, he was really popular. Both Eros and Cupid – have lots of stories written about them. Um, famously, I uh, like I, I don't know because I read this. I don't know if it's Psyche or Psyche. I think it's Psyche. But Eros and Psyche have like this love story where they they have to get it's this big story, and actually it ends up being the inspiration for Beauty and the Beast in the 1700s. As people are kind of redeveloping and their love for Greek mythology and stuff, they kind of incorporate it more into their stuff. So you get the Beauty and the Beast from that story of Eros and Psyche. And Cupid has like these old stories too. So as they're reading these old stories, Cupid is kind of getting back into the world of love and boom, they start associating him with what holiday, but the love holiday, which has to be Valentine's. So that's kind of how Cupid flies in on his weird wings and bow and arrow and whatnot. It's just as like all of that Greek culture is re, is re you know, Resinking into the culture they bring uh with them little cupid and put him on the love holiday and by the early 1700s americans are giving each other cards mexico is celebrating um i mean it's not called mexico yet but you know the, the area of mexico is celebrating I mean, it's not a country i should say like it's not something it's a colony but it's celebrating valentine's day canada is celebrating valentine's day the united kingdom and france it's becoming a practice that's pretty kind of recognized as a real thing um and cards are becoming pretty commonplace that you just expect to give, you know, Valentine's Day cards to people. Now, in the 1800s, there's this weird phenomenon that happens called vinegar Valentines, which sound awful, um, and they were awful. And I don't know that they happened everywhere. I know they happened in the United Kingdom from what I was reading, but I don't know that they followed it. Like, I don't know if people were doing this in Mexico, but they were in the United Kingdom. So in the 1800s, it used to be really expensive to send mail because, like, if you sent a letter, the person who you sent the letter to, they had to pay for it. And it could be like five pennies. It could be like six oh. pennies. And if they didn't accept it, the mail just kind of like got thrown out. Like, oh, you don't want your letter? Fine. Toss it in the trash, basically. Because that letter could have had to go over like a toll bridge and all these different things could have happened that made that letter more expensive. And so like a letter could have costed you like 15 cents. And in 1840, the people had basically protested and lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and said, get, the, get it to just be one penny everywhere. One penny, no matter where I'm sending the letter, it goes, it lands there for one penny. And the law passes and they make it one cent to send the letter pretty much in anywhere in the United Kingdom. Um, and they had to put together, it was a lot of work for them, but the postal service really gets it together. And now for the first time, you can kind of send a card to somebody without having to bring it yourself or having a friend like drop it off as they go. And it can still show up pretty quickly and not only that, but it's really cheap to do so. Now it's one cent. And when it becomes one penny, now people have this really cheap, easy way to communicate. But of course, like as we saw with the internet, when people had a cheap and easy way to communicate, they <laughs> like immediately oh, started no. using it for evil. And so they started creating these vinegar Valentines. So people were sending each other Valentine's Day cards. They could send them in the mail for one cent. And these people started, at least in Britain, started sending like these evil versions of Valentines where they would write poetry and draw really ugly pictures uh, the people the pictures are so insulting like i was looking at the last night i was like these people look horrible who why who has the time to draw ugly pictures of people and add poetry to them and send them but they're like mean versions of memes i don't even know what you call it. so i i copied 
two of like the poets down. I'd love to say it's like these are the best, but these were just the shortest. So I wouldn't have to remember like copy down longer ones. Um, but it says, you fancy that you display such grace, but how can you do that with such a face? So that's one of a vinegar Valentine, just a complete slam. I'm and then this one, <laughs> and then there's another one that says, poor old croaker, stop your clack. You don't need to paint everything quite so black, which I actually kind of <laughs> like that one. Um, but that's the kind of thing people were receiving in the mail. Some of these are kind of fun. Like they're lighthearted ribbings. People got them. They knew, okay, it's just, you're being funny. That's fine. Like it's a goofy meme kind of thing. And then some of them were quite mean. Like somebody would send you a Valentine and this is what you get in response. And then some of them were just cruel and were just like, I don't like you, so I'm going to write this to you. And because I can send this in the mail anonymously now, because they have to take it for one cent, I don't have to put my name all over it. So I can just send you hate, basically. And this is kind of where we start getting <laughs> hate mail coming from. Yeah. And so these we are starting think, to go around in, in Britain. We think the way that Twitter is and we think the way that the Internet is is like something new. No, people were always like this. You just gave them an avenue. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. People always wanted to show their their meanness to one another. I will say, I do wish Twitter had a little bit more of like the the poetry side of it. You know, I wish if yeah. you were going to slam dunk on people, it was a little bit more of like you old clack and you know you're that kind of thing. <laughs> that that's a little bit more fun, I think, than what we have. But the pictures are just oh, no. cool. It's always like old ladies with giant noses. <laughs> oh, terrible. And America had a similar problem. They also were kind of getting cards were becoming a thing. They were drawing like little love comics. Um, it, some of those comics were kind of going in the wrong direction, getting a little too um, romantic, maybe is a way to put it, a little bit too raunchy. And it got to the point where like post office workers were literally like throwing out lots and lots of cards because they were so vulgar. They didn't, and so of seeing, they didn't want to carry them and deliver them to people. So again, as people got the ability to make mail, they immediately started doing some not so good things with them. <laughs> um, and post office workers complained too. They said Valentine's Day was the worst because there was just so many daggum letters between like the, you know, that air, that month around Valentine's Day, because everyone had to send something to somebody. It was such an important holiday that the poor postal workers were like, we're getting worked to death. We had to work like all day to just get all these stupid Valentine cards everywhere. And this is also yeah. partially because right around this time, people were no longer having to even write their own Valentines. They were starting to sell pre-made mass produced Valentines. Factories of women, especially like in Britain, would come together and just make Valentine's Day cards all day that would then start getting sold. One factory in Britain supposedly had 3,000 women making Valentines at it and Charles Dickens called it Cupid, Cupid's Manufactory. America also saw this kind of uptick where a woman who, whose name is Esther Holland or Howland was a girl. She worked at her father's bookstore. He was like a, you know, a supply bookstore kind of person. And she saw all these Valentine's Day cards from Europe, wanted to make her own, but she wanted to go even further. And so she started tying ribbons to them. She started tying lace to them, putting frills on them, making them, you know, look really nice, like very different and got yeah. her workers to mass produce those kind of things. And that's officially where we get like the Valentine, like why that card looks so unique and different compared to every other card, why it's so much more stuff to it is because of this Esther Holland person who said like, no, I want this card to like really stand out. She, her nickname is yeah. the mother of the American Valentine. Her fancy cards with all the frills would make her a hundred thousand dollars a year just making valentine's cards which again hundred thousand dollars a year back in like 1860 is pretty good considering what she's that's a doing. millionaire yeah, yeah she's living very well off of ribbons and frills on cards and 18 yeah in 1868 the british chocolate company cadbury started selling these heart-shaped chocolates and that i mean chocolate was already kind of associated with it but that just goes like the extra mile right um, mm -hmm. which is good because before that, like the gifts people were giving in the early 1800s, because romantic love was always there, but you really could marry for romantic love now, especially in America. Um, the people were giving each other spoons and gloves. And so I'm quite glad we stepped it up for chocolates because <laughs> that's kind of weird that your special Valentine Day, you know, hey girl, I was thinking about you and I saw the spoon and it just seemed just right. It just seemed to me <laughs> be kind of a weird one. So yeah, my marriage is now kind of getting more popular and they're they're having to figure out what kind of gifts to give each other because again, they I guess they weren't doing it yet. Right. So uh, not until the year 1913 do you get to Hallmark. So Hallmark sells a few special cards in 1913. And then 1916, they really pump it up 
and do like the whole Valentine's Day card thing, which makes sense. Hallmark the is war? the yeah, but Hallmark is the biggest card manufacturer, so like of course they would not skip out on Valentine's Day, which is very right, very right. popular, right? But people now call it like oh that's just a Hallmark holiday. And I mean, as you can tell from the story, like Hallmark only shows up here at the very end of the story. At this point, Valentine's Day is pretty much set and now it's spreading around the world and then Hallmark gets involved. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. It's not really fair to call that one a Hallmark holiday. It was actually already pretty much a thing by the 1600s. If you were living in a lot of countries, you were celebrating some version of Valentine's Day and it was a romantic holiday. However, like I'm not saying Hallmark hasn't created a holiday. I mean, grandparents say, come on, like that one's definitely a Hallmark holiday. <laughs> There's no, there's no reason for that one sans buying a Hallmark card. But this one actually was quite culturally embedded in our lives long before Hallmark got a hold of it. And now right. in the year 2013, Americans sent 190 million cards. Um, I believe in the year 2019 like or 2020, it was only 145 million. It is the second biggest card giving holiday only one bigger is christmas and if you include all the cards that kids give each other because each kid shows up with like 20 cards and you know they all pass yeah. them back and forth then it could be as high as 1 billion cards given because of all the kid halt the kid stuff too um so which makes it crazy huge and americans in the year 2021 were expected to spend about 21 billion dollars just in america on Valentine's between going out to eat, getting a card, getting each other a little present or something like that. It all ends up being around, um, I think about $115 on Valentine's per family. Well, wow. or at least per American. So that actually might be like a 230 if both people do it. So, I mean, this is a huge holiday in some ways. It is like actually one of the biggest holidays because like when you think of big holidays, you think of Christmas, Thanksgiving, you know, 4th of July, maybe, um, and Easter might be one too, if you're a Christian for sure, mm -hmm. but actually and then Halloween, but actually Valentine's is one of the other biggest ones. It's celebrated by everyone. It's just such a small holiday. You don't notice it. Like it's really easy to celebrate and it's, but it's so that makes it actually like really ubiquitous for everyone at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's not like Christmas where there's a huge big deal about it. So it is actually one of the biggest holidays. It's just not as, you know, stop the presses, don't go to work, you know, take a week yeah. off kind of thing like Christmas. Right, is. Right. So again, because it's such a smaller, easier to celebrate holiday, it's actually more ubiquitous in some ways. Yeah. Hmm. But speaking of Hallmark holidays, little known fact, did you know that they that Hallmark created Father's Day for single mothers? I did not know that. Or you would think that if you see Twitter on Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> i was sitting here like is that that's weird why would they do that you had me on that one i was just like i mean weird stuff happens i would have totally believed you but man you, know, you should have just left it like that let me sign off and be like anyway totally lied to him what a schmuck no so honestly 200 years 300 years down the line from now who knows it may culturally be associated with single that's mothers true. instead yeah like, they'll be like why do we call this father's day they're like it's always been like this you know this is how it is <laughs> <laughs> single mother's day is called father's day now now stand there while we slap you with this meat <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> we're definitely going further i back in that direction i ascribed that holiday and most of us are like that's crazy but some people are like yeah i mean we're getting there right we'll, we won't, we're not too far off from that give it another 50 years we'll see yeah were you able to get through your notes me yeah. Yeah, you didn't even notice, huh? I didn't read it in NPR voice. I had it. I, I definitely <laughs> just read all my notes to you. No, I was just making sure because your heart out is in two minutes. And I wanted it to is. make sure we, we hit all the things. Hey, I want to help the listener. Heart out is a term that we radio people <laughs> use. Um, and I definitely knew what it was before this broadcast. And it just means I had to leave at that time. Right. <laughs> well, we we really appreciate you coming on and, and kind of laying out the, the myth the legend in the history of yeah. St. Valent, the St. Valentines. Yeah. Um, it's I know the St. Valentine who almost didn't come up at all in this episode because he was mentioned <laughs> like for 10 seconds at the beginning. But we'll say, but you'll hear people say St. Valentine's Day and then someone mm. will come along and correct them and say it's St. Valentine. Well, no, actually it's not. St. Valentine's is more correct because there's more than one guy. So would it be happy St. Valentine's? Valentine? The, the saints valentine would be more appropriate yes but i'm gonna let people go with valentine that works yeah so I, i'm with you on that one here, I, yeah. go ahead here's my annoying question i asked you it last time but it's been a couple months is there anything in your life that's giving you hope to and motivating you to keep going 
Um, what's, yeah, what's the bright I'm, spot? The, sure. For me, it's just the Lord is still moving. The Lord's doing good things. I feel um, mm -hmm. like God is working on my life and working in the lives of other people around me. And it's not always easy, but I, I just see, I don't know, this is just more personal than anything. It's just, I just see God doing stuff. Um, yeah you know we're out here doing ministry in cambodia so like there's a lot of stuff that can sometimes be very hard sometimes just you know ministry with other people can be difficult too but i see god working and we've been we've been doing a lot of stuff and a lot of things are in in flux and i, I i'm like yeah this is good this is good and you know sometimes i'm working with my kids and they can be quite antagonistic towards god but i have to remind myself like that's something it's better than apathetic which is where they were a few months ago so we're moving yeah um they're feeling something now they're 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 engaging with it enough to feel anger or frustration and that's sometimes a good thing too so yeah just yeah. Yeah. the lord is still greatly at work in the world um and it it you wouldn't believe it while watching the news but that's probably because you know the news has zero interest in telling you about what the lord is doing so that's yeah. why it's going to seem that way well i appreciate you coming back on we thank you very much if people want to find you before you go uh, you can follow Troy on Twitter at Revive Thoughts, and you can also check out the, there are six shows now, or it's sixth is coming soon. Well, yeah, we're working on a new show. Um, it will be out hopefully in March, so I can't, um, but it will be about Hollywood celebrity. It's actually called Forgotten Hollywood, and it's about a guy who like has a lot of experience working in the Hollywood world and just kind of the interesting roots of different things we believe about Hollywood um, and about like different things that are going on with like, especially how a lot of like, there's a lot more Christian influence and stuff. It's very interesting. Uh, I'll let him present the show here soon to people, but it's really cool. He came to us and we're Hi. very excited about it. But we also have Revive Thoughts where we take these awesome old sermons of the past and bring them back for people to hear them and hear the backstories. We have Martyrs and Missionaries, which is my wife's show where she tells the stories of, you know, you guessed it, martyrs and missionaries usually they're a lot longer than saint valentine's um and then we have revive devos which is a daily devotional that comes out every day I and mean, we just have a lot of stuff going on so come check out revive studios if you enjoy history um if you want to learn more about your faith if you are a christian and you want to grow i uh, highly recommend checking out our studio church history has a lot i think to add to your perspective yeah so check that out at revivedthoughts.com right all right thank awesome. you so much for having me on guys good night or, you. i'm sorry bye. for you it's good night yeah bye bye <laughs> thank you So, Jessica, yes. what did you learn? What did I learn? Yeah. Um, I actually learned quite a bit about how the commercial side of the holiday formed. Because I did yeah. a lot of in-depth research about the saint side of it because I had mm -hmm. written an article for my church's newsletter. So some of that stuff I kind of already knew. Um, but the way that the commercial holiday formed is kind of interesting. And um, although we glazed over this, I, I think if I go looking into it, I'm going to find out that uh, World War I had a lot to do with pushing those Valentine cards because sure. sweethearts were separated from each other by great distances. Yeah. And so they would have wanted to send things to one another to remind each other of their love, which, you know, isn't a necessarily a bad thing or something we ought to deride. Like yeah, we, we spend the day telling people that we love them. It's not such a bad thing. Yeah, and I think it's also just there's this interesting evolution of how people viewed love over time. Because mm -hmm. once, at one point, or at least marriage, they viewed it as duty, as creating heirs, as making alliances. Yep. They, it was put together by their parents. And then there was that shift to romantic love. There was that shift to choosing one another and submitting to one another and to loving one another. And it's just, that's really cool. And it's it's so funny. Like for some reason, I never realized that Cupid was a Roman god. I just assumed it was some made up, stupid thing. So here's something with some 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 kind of tenuous connection to something in the past, but I had no idea. So something that um, I didn't know until later was that baby, that fat baby with wings had for all of my life been termed a cherub yeah a cherubim yep right mm -hmm. um when you look at how cherubim are described by church tradition in the bible they're horrifying creatures oh yeah, yeah. six-winged many-eyed soaring aloft terrifying yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's nothing fat baby cute fluffy wings about a cherubim if or you saw seraphim. a cherub or a seraphim if you saw either of those things you'd probably go insane so, um, <laughs> or fall down dead as many in the, in the Bible are 
want to do when they see angels. So well, I just I'm, I'm interested how this this image of a Roman god Eros became associated with this image of cherubs and how they kind of got like conglomerated together. I that, would I would bet on medieval art. Yeah, that's yeah, what I, I would mean, bet. Um, but it is interesting because this is a conversation I had with someone on Twitter not that long ago, and I'd like to do a show about it at some point and find someone who's really good on this. But uh, even some the things that Paul the Apostle fought through his epistles and w in Acts are still fights that we are having today in the Christian world. Yep. So there's the, the Gnosticism has found a home in Christianity in ways that it shouldn't have. Greek um, metaphysics and certain things are have found their way into Christianity where yep. they, sh they shouldn't be, or even uh, Judaism. Um, mm -hmm. But then in, one of the things that's interesting is when you say, when I found out that Cupid was a god, and secondly, you know, we see cherubim as that. It's just another proof that that is something that's invaded the Christian realm, yeah. which isn't good. No. But there are a lot of things that have embedded themselves in that are very hard to talk about because people take them very seriously. Even some churches embedded into their um, fundamental truths or whatever. And it's right. like, but this doesn't, this isn't in the Bible. This is an understanding that you're bringing to the Bible from outside sources. And so like, there's so much that needs to be broken down, I think, in people's minds, not in the church. I'm not saying we should destroy any church. I'm saying there are certain <laughs> concepts that have become a, like almost integral parts of the way the masses understand Christianity that sure. do not come from the Bible or from tradition mm -hmm. outside of, you know, outside sources. And, and a lot of people will think of tradition as um, cultural practices. Right. And it actually has like the, the meaning in terms of the church actually has more of like a historical background. And then there, there's little T tradition, which is the way that people sort of um, have outward expressions of their faith or outward expressions of their culture, which is sort of different than church tradition, something I've been right. kind of learning about lately because I, I, a lot of people, myself included, didn't know until I started studying this topic that um, there were hundreds of years of church before there was ever a codified text that said, okay, yeah. this is what the text is. And so a lot of that stuff does get handed yeah, they were down just to passed us around as letters and church fathers oral yeah. oral tradition and that um back in those days in the very early days of the church that written records were not considered as reliable as oral teachings we think of that as the opposite today but back in those days you had to have um a connection to your teacher that yeah. teacher was known and you got your teachings from him a person yeah. writing things down that person could change anything they wanted to not that many people knew how to read. And so where, where for us, having something written makes it more official. In their yeah. time, oral, things that were said orally had way more um, uh, credit uh, well, to them than... And, and that's why Paul's epistles and certain other writing, you know, all of the epistles are so important, especially mm -hmm. Paul, because he set these churches, he gave the oral tradition in the churches, and then he was criticizing or calling out bad behavior and bad theology through these letters mm -hmm. because he was at a different church doing work. And so it's, it's really fascinating, but it's, it's good to see that there are people out there who are willing to dive into the history who are willing mm -hmm. to dive into the parts that most people gloss over or have no idea might not have come from the right place. Right. Right. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm just glad that there are people out there that are, they're like, Oh, Hey, we, we understand this this way, but it's because of that. And I, I, I don't mm -hmm. want to get too deep into the specifics of what I'm talking about because it's, it's, I have to do more study before sure. I get there. Sure. Um, but there's a lot of stuff I keep noticing. Like uh, one of the, I th I'll say the main one has to be this kind of Gnostic idea that's broken out into Christianity that at the end of things, you end up in heaven and you don't, you're not on earth anymore. Mm. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of this understanding going on where, where you, when you die, you go to heaven and then people don't talk about the bodily resurrection. Some people right. say it's just a spiritual resurrection and you're in heaven. It's like, that's not what, the teaching ever was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm.
you're you're mi mixing stuff up and i think it's just something and that's why oral tradition can get rough and it's mm -hmm. better to have these I, th I mean it's really good to have a good oral tradition in an oral tradition culture mm -hmm. but in a written tradition culture you start you hear the preacher mm -hmm. then you tell the same thing later and then that person tells the you know and it devolves over time right so having right. having that written record is very important but mm -hmm. that's not about valentine's day but I did want to end since we did our episode with Binkley last week for Valentine's Day, and we're doing we're doing a double feature, which is kind of odd for Valentine's Day. But I think both of these, the fun romantic part with Binkley is important, and the <laughs> the academic part is also very important. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I I'm curious, what is the best Valentine gift card or whatever that you ever received? Oh, let's see. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the the standards, you know, a nice dinner, some flowers. You know, I, I, I'm not a complicated kind of person when it comes to that. You don't have to get me jewelry or anything like that. Just, you know, um, uh, really just letting the person know that you're thinking of them, whatever the token is, it can yeah. be a cheap little, you know, neon bear that you got from Walmart. It doesn't have to be expensive. the The point of Valentine's is not the expense of the gift. It's it's yeah. the fact that you're letting people know that you're thinking of them. And was there anything know, that ever stood out though, like or a, a moment or a gesture? Okay, so a gesture. It wasn't specifically for Valentine's Day, but um, someone did something really romantic for me once in my life mm. that I will relay to you guys. Um, <laughs> I had a um, I as you can tell. I really like books. They're mm. kind of my thing. I have lots of them. This shelf is not even like the beginning of the book collection that I have. And um, when I was young, I was dating someone for very stupid reasons and we broke up and um, he had boxes of my books and he wouldn't give them back to me because he knew that they were very special to me. And that was just kind of his way of being a jerk was not to give me these books back. Well, this other guy who liked me and wanted to court me, as they say, um, went over there, <laughs> walked in the guy's front door, picked up all my boxes of books, put them in his car and left. And the ex, he was such a, a, a weenie. He didn't do anything about it. But so this other guy showed back up to my house with all of my books, rescued them from my ex-boyfriend's house. And so the rescue of my books is probably <laughs> one of the more romantic things that anybody has ever done for me. Um, I also had a group of Cholo Mexican dudes <laughs> save me <laughs> in the senior parking lot at high school. Um, I had a bad boy. I've had a lot of bad boyfriends. So I had a bad boyfriend. He was trying to make me get into his car and we were fighting and I didn't want to get in the car with him because he was angry. And when he was angry, he drove like a jerk. So I was saying, no, I'm not going to get in the car. I'm not going to get in the car. And he's yelling at me to get in the car. And these like Cholo dudes like all came up and they're like, hey. She says she not get in the car. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, it's it's funny because it, it's it's hard because you'll have these histories with different people throughout your life, and then you get married, and it's like that's the end all be all, you know. Yes. Especially when you, uh, especially when you have children, like uh, th that's a, a just a different level of like, well, this woman, look what this woman did for me, <laughs> my God. Uh, right. But I will say, before my wife, I, there was uh, when I went to college. I drove, the drive was like 10 hours away from home. And uh, my girlfriend at the time um, made me a gift and she had mapped out where I was going to be driving through. Yeah. And she, she, in the box, she had like little boxes and things. And it said, when you hit Dothan, open this. When you yeah. hit th uh, this place, open this. And it was like, a, there was a snack or there was a thing. Oh, it ended up with so like a, thoughtful. with like a um, journal and some, guitar picks and this that and the other and i was just like this is just uh, just sweet yeah. so sweet <laughs> that's really thoughtful see it doesn't have to be expensive it's really that yeah. this, someone was thinking about you yep and that's that's the world you know oh, not yeah. everybody has someone to think about them so you know when 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 you do it let people know yeah well and i i, I want to say something for the the people who claim that valentine's day is single awareness day Oh. Um, I am sorry that you're having a bad year, but I love you. And so does Jessica. Mm -hmm. So 
rest in the oh. fact that despite that, you're loved by yeah. random people on the internet who like to make uh, wiener jokes every now and then. There is something to do with the word love that I've been noticing, especially since we've started like studying the Bible intensely. Yeah. The, and how imprecise it is. How imprecise, especially the English language is. Yes. We have this word love. And in Greek, there are over 15 words that translate back to English to mean love. But mm -hmm. in Greece, there, you know, it's the love you have for your parents, the love that you have for your children, the love that you have for your spouse, the love you have for your friends. There are so many different types of love to really truncate everything into this single four little word just Eros. really doesn't do it justice. Yes. And um, you don't have to necessarily be in a romantic relationship to have love and to know that you're loved. And so Valentine's Day is not just about couples. It's also about all of the other people in your life that show you love. And you know you've got them. You know you've got your parents and your friends and your pets. And just, you know, well, most of us, for the most part, it, part of the human condition are surrounded by love. We don't always appreciate it, but, you know, okay, you don't have a girlfriend, but look around at what you do have, because there's probably a lot of love in your life that you're not acknowledging because you're salty about the girlfriend thing. So just yeah. throwing that out there. Well, yeah, and I think it's, th there are so many words for love in Greek, just like there are so many words for snow in Inuit. Like it's, mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it's, it, they, and they, they had to separate some stuff out because they were also some weird and bad people in Greece for one thing. But in the Bible, it uses, there are four different words used in the Bible for love, four different Greek words. There's eros, storge, agape, and philia. So um, eros being romantic love, mm -hmm. uh, storge being family love, um, Philia being like brotherly love. That's where the word, mm -hmm. the, the city Philadelphia gets Philadelphia. its name from. Mm -hmm. And and then agape, which is God's divine love. Mm -hmm. It's it's the love that you share. But it's, it's also, it's godly love between Christians as well. Right. So regardless of where you are this Valentine's Day, if you feel sad, rest in the fact that me and Jessica agape you. <laughs> I want you to be happier. <laughs> <laughs> so beyond that <laughs> that's all we've got it was a it is a good episode short one i'm sorry but i wanted to give you at least an hour because i feel like i owe we owe you at least an hour of your time yeah <laughs> i mean so we, we we got a little chatting in at the end but i do have stuff to tell you about what's coming up but let's start with the the basics if you haven't heard i was kicked off of twitter because i told a certain canadian prime minister a certain schoolyard phrase that was also <laughs> used on the Golden Girls, and you can find in a in GIF form on Twitter. So, I mean, that happens. So, I'm no longer at Cam Harless. I am at Ham Carless, which is a small pig in a bowler hat waiting for a bus. Um, so, follow me there because I'm I'm deficient in followers. That gummit. I got to like almost 2,100. I was so. I was happy. There was growth. And now it's like, oh, that's cut in by more than half. Mm. But Jessica's still around because she she plays it cool on Twitter. She doesn't mm. tell Canadian prime ministers to uh, eat poo poo and and die um, Not to their faces. <laughs> so if you want to follow her, she is still at soup canarchist. Follow her there. Um, beyond that, I'm going to tell you what's coming up next week. We have Nick and Lizzie Picone coming on the show. You've Yay. you've heard from Nick a lot. We've we've talked to uh, him and Lizzie one time before, mm -hmm. but we thought it'd be a really great conversation because it's the end of two months. One being the month with Valentine's Day, the love month, and it's also the end of Black History Month. And Nick and Lizzie are a interracial couple. And two or three times after we've gotten off the the show with them, we've talked at length about their relationship and how it works. And how people act about it. And I think it's a it's a conversation that should happen on line. So we're going to do that next week. I think it should be a lot of fun. After that, we're talking to Kat Kattinson. She mm -hmm. is a girl who uh, transitioned to either, I, I don't know if it was non-binary or male. Uh, and then detransitioned back to female. And this is a an interesting life story. And one that a lot of activists... They don't want these people to exist. So obviously I want to talk about it. Uh, past that, Jessica's out for a week. 
and she's being replaced by a guest host who is Miss Monica Perez. It'll just be me and Monica shooting the shooting the poop, chewing the cud, having fun. And then after that, we're going to have our St. Patrick's Day episode, which mm-hmm. we, we will have Mr. Cody Cook back for the show. And we're going to be talking about it's going to be a fun time. We have him coming back <laughs> for serious stuff later, but we're talking fun <laughs> stuff for St. Patrick's Day. And I, for one, need you guys to send me some Irish whiskey so I can do it right. Is too much to ask? <laughs> I just need some Red Breast 12. I don't know what you want from me. Um, but to cu- cap us off, if you want to watch these early when we have early shows, there are several of those coming up in, in the near future. You can join our Patreon at uh, pa- patreon.com slash the mad ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have t-shirts, mugs, tanks at we are the mad ones.com slash store. Um, we have a Bible study. We've talked about it and we've mentioned it. We mentioned it a lot, but you should join it if you want. We're mm-hmm. midway through acts, by the way, I think I'm going to move it down to, I may move it down to two chapters a week so that we can <laughs> dig into those. It seems like it's moving itself down to two chapters, yeah. but you go ahead and think that's your call. <laughs> no, no, I could, I could push it to five. I could push it to five. It just, I've we done wouldn't, it. we, we, we really like to get into the nitty gritty. And so no. be, leaving it at two kind of gives us that freedom to like play yeah. around with the ideas for a little while, which I think yeah. is beneficial. We did, we did three last week because I thought oh, it was going to be two, but no. Yeah. Um, okay. So beyond that, if you're listening, we're also on YouTube, youtube.com slash the mad ones. We're on Odyssey. We're on Rockfin. Just search for us there. All the links are below. Um, if you are watching, if you'd prefer not to see my face, we're on every podcatcher. And if you go to we are the mad ones.com, you can listen directly from there. But beyond that, that's all I've got for you. That's all the shilling. So uh, got anything nice to say to the to the sad people that watch our show? Um. There's a really good Netflix series called The Last of the Czars, which is a hmm. docudrama about um, the last days of Nicholas and Alexandra hmm. um, right before the communi- communist revolution. It is um, a seriously good, um, somewhat faithful to history docudrama that I definitely <laughs> recommend. I'm watching it right now and it's awesome. So um, please go watch it and rate it highly so they make more. Thank you. Yeah. And so with that, I'm <laughs> going to move into NPR voice. And wait, let me get my let me get my implement so I can make it ASMR too. Oh, Jesus. I hate you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I do that, not agape that. <laughs> <laughs> with that, um, you have a chance to be a light in the world. So go light it up.